the thing that I remember the, the most was on September 3rd, I think it was, when war was declared uh, with, between Germany and England, he went right to the phone to, to phone his mother, and the operator came on and said, that country is at war, there are no telephones. That scared him, that really scared him. Hitchcock, when he left England, was very concerned for all of his time about the war. He had his mother there. In fact, he went back to England. England is at war in 1940 to, to convince his mother to come to America. Now, he couldn't budge her, but he got her out of the city. His brother was there. Some of the family was there. Very, very concerned. I think it was probably felt that it was a righteous war. You know, we had been attacked. Uh, so there was a sense in which, um, you know, a, a, a free American citizen needed to do his duty when his government came calling. I think making this one and foreign correspondent, all the ones that he made at that time, were all, you know, very pro-allies, pro-English, pro-American. He was very conscious of that. When Hitchcock first came to America, he was under contract to David O. Selznick. Selznick was a very important force here. He was um, a purely independent producer who commanded the best sources, the best technicians. And of course, Selznick knew he could make money from Hitchcock. He knew that offers were coming in from every studio, and he knew that he could loan him out. One of those studios was 20th Century Fox. Daryl F. Zanuck, head of production at Fox, finally made a deal with Selznick to borrow Hitchcock. But you know, Hitchcock knew that he tampered. He was involved in every aspect of production like Selznick. So he staved him off, and of course, Selznick urged him to do it because it was a matter of being suspended if he didn't take this, 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 uh, this option from Fox. He went at a time when he knew very well that Zadok had joined the war effort, and he wasn't there. So he comes, 1942, and the first thing he does, he comes with his own idea. It's the steward. There's a woman. And a baby. You pick up the paper Tuesday, you pick up the paper Wednesday, there are stories of people being rescued in the oceans on lifeboats after their ships were torpedoed or the plane came down. In fact, he even told his friends what a wonderful idea for a movie to have these people isolated on a lifeboat. He always liked some kind of technical challenge. And this was a challenge. How do you make an hour and a half movie of all of these people on a lifeboat? Now, Hitch wanted an acclaimed writer to do the screenplay, and he went after John Steinbeck. Steinbeck, who had done already Tortilla Flat, was already done Of Mice and Men, what was the, that was the acclaimed one, and then, of course, Grapes of Wrath. It was a way to sell the picture. It was a way to advertise the movie. Hollywood wanted him very badly. They wanted him to do work. They wanted him to do film scripts. And Steinbeck resisted. Uh, his wife at the time was very much concerned about what was oftentimes referred to as going Hollywood, that he would lose his artistic integrity, that the money would make them soft somehow. And Steinbeck uh, agreed with that. When World War II came along, Steinbeck wanted a volunteer. Uh, he tried to enlist and had difficulty because they had a, the FBI had a file on him. They thought of him as a radical. And so they were distrustful of him, but he wanted to find some other way to contribute. You know, by 1942, when Hitchcock approached him, I think the reason that Steinbeck was so interested was that he wanted to continue doing something that would indicate his patriotism. The original version of Lifeboat was a novella that Steinbeck wrote, and it's narrated in the first person. So it's not, it's not at all like what one would imagine an original screenplay to be. It's very interesting. He used the perspective of this um, character who would eventually become Kovac, the proletarian, the pro. Also, the center of the piece was the German. Steinbeck looked at the German character in the novella in a way that was probably quite distinct from the way in which he eventually is characterized in Hitchcock's movie. In Steinbeck's original treatment in the novella, he comes on board, he's already, he has a broken arm. He's a lot less effectual than, than he is in the movie version. And also, they never know whether he was actually the captain of the U-boat. 
weißt nicht, wie gut ich dir bin. Hitch always saw from the very beginning the German as an important character, but he wanted this film constructed around a very sophisticated and superficial photojournalist. And of course, he had only one person in mind for this reporter, and that was Tallulah Bankhead. You may call me Connie. You did once during the storm, remember? You said, uh, you might as well go down together, eh, right, Connie? I like the way you said Connie. You'd like a sock in the jaw. Tallulah was an established star, uh, you know, especially on the stage. And then she made the movie. I think she was marvelous. I don't, I don't think it would have been that good without her. He said, who would be the most ironic, the most shocking and outrageous persona to put in the middle of Atlantic in a lifeboat? Tallulah Bankhead in a lifeboat? This is impossible. I mean, what a draw this was. I mean, Hitchcock was also very commercial savvy. What a draw this was. You're Constance Porter. I heard you were aboard. So you took pictures, huh? And what pictures? Priceless. Oh, I caught some wonderful shots on deck. A little knot of people around one of the lifeboats. They look slow and heavy and fat with the life belts on. So lonesome. After doing a draft, Steinbeck left for Europe to cover the war for the New York Herald Tribune. It was at this point that Broadway playwright and movie writer since 1929, Joe Swirling, was brought in to work on the script. And so we now have McGowan and Hitchcock and Alma and Joe Swirling uh, adding, subtracting. And this draft, the film begins to take shape. Hitchcock cast it down to the minutest player. You start with Willie, the uh, author of Slazer character. He was known uh, in German films at this time, Austrian-born and on German stage, and had come to America in the early 40s. I think 42 was his first film. So he's just starting as a character actor in movies. I think the person that stands out the most was Walter Slazak. I thought he was marvelous, just marvelous. You felt sorry for him, which you shouldn't have. Well, where'd he come from? She you remember? Well, I never saw him before. Not off our boat. Thank you, Shane. When you fish somebody like this from the ocean, who is got a warm, kindly face, paternal face, heavy, so he likes food, and so many people in the audience like food, that brings us toward him, you know. It brings us toward him. So that's why he was cast. William Bendix also was just getting started in movies. And he becomes a very important support. Of course, in the 50s, he moves to the center in television with his Life of Riley. Hodiak, Hitchcock saw him in a screen test, a screen test with Canada Lee at MGM, but he soon joined Fox and becomes a contractee at Fox. He pretty much re remains a supporting character and never becomes uh, a star, probably because Dana Andrews kind of is in that mold, is in that persona. Henry Hall as the capitalist, well, he's been around since 1917. Tallulah was very hard on him. He was old and he muffled lines and it would require a retake. And at one point she said to him, why don't you memorize your lines? Okay, you're, you're so old, you're doddering everything. He took it, he didn't strike back at all. Miss McKenzie! out there. She's alive. Now, Hume Cronin became a friend of Hitchcock, a friend of the family. In fact, he was a writer as well as an actor. He did the treatment for Patrick Hamilton's Rope's End for Hitchcock when Hitchcock made that into the film Rope. And then there was the Canada Lee character. Well, he saw him in a screen test. He was just getting started. MGM, I don't think, used him in anything. But uh, he had that wonderful face, kind of an angelic a face that he liked and he knew it could be used to create sympathy. Mary Anderson, who had played the nurse, had been part of Selznick's entourage in Gone with the Wind. Mary Anderson we knew least of all. She was working here at Fox and they were a little upset because there weren't any Fox people in the movie. So they said, you're taking Mary Anderson. So we took Mary Anderson. <laughs> Mary 
The set was ingenious, and of course, it was a technological problem that was a challenge to Hitchcock, and he met it. Forty-foot lifeboat in this tank of water, a lot of water. The water was gushing. The boat almost coming apart in the storm. Wind machines to make the wind happen. He probably felt that this was the way it, it should be shot. You know, I mean, short of going out in the Atlantic, you know, with a camera, <laughs> there wasn't really any other way to shoot it. There would be different parts of the boat. You know that they had it cut in half naturally, so the camera could get there. You know. And of course, the second boat that they used was for whenever there was a perspective, a horizon. They put this against a backdrop. He totally preferred being on the set. He hated location. He said, "You've got the noise, you've got the weather, you've got this, you've got that before you can, you know, shoot the scene." He was working with one set, and he had to make sure that. One shot was different from another shot. The storyboarding in this film was very extensive, more than any film up to this time. Ninety-six minutes. How do you make every shot look different from another shot? So, as a guide to make sure that he had enough movement between shots, enough of a diversion between shots, he used this as a guide. He worked it out. And he drew the whole picture. He he would draw all the scenes in the picture, and he would say to the cameraman, "All right, this is what I want." And there he would have drawn it, perfection. He wanted it to be perfect. It was like a fear. How was he going to do it? How was he going to do it? It was all about conquering fear. How was he going to make order out of this very chaotic thing? And that's what movies were for him. It was a way to make order. Production was arduous. People were always being slapped by water, coming down with colds. Tallulah Bank had twice pneumonia. Hume Cronin cracking ribs. They felt damp and then very, very hot with all of the lights and scenes where there was blazing sun. And of course, ten people cramped in a boat with Tallulah, who was off the set and on the set, difficult. She was always dropping names, which got everybody very upset. And since the war began, she was on the wagon. You know, she didn't drink, and she was telling everybody about this hundreds of times a day. And amidst the co-stars, nobody else was on her level, so she could lord it over them very, very well. And there was a famous story about Tallulah Bankhead. When they had the lifeboat up about twelve、um, feet from the ground, well, Tallulah had a rather unfortunate habit of not wearing underwear. <laughs> and so finally, the assistant director came to my father and said, "Will you talk to Miss Bankhead about please wearing underwear?" And my father said. Well, I'm not going to do that, and I don't know whether that comes under makeup or hairdressing. <laughs> They recognized in each other legends. She had read his copy. He had read her copy. They both came off as very outrageous people, kindred spirits. They saw themselves as buddies. That's what they were. As much as he let Tallulah get away with things, he didn't let Mary Anderson get away with things. First of all, she would always be fishing for a compliment, you know.、Uh, and at one time, she had asked Hitch, "Mr. Hitchcock, wh- which is my better side?" And he cut her off with,、um, "My dear, you're sitting on it." When I think of Lifeboat, the scene that stands out the most for me is where my grandfather actually made his appearance. He had become famous in his films for making an appearance. At some point, normally just walking by in a crowd. How was he ever going to put himself in this lifeboat? He is 300 pounds, probably when he starts this film. Of course, he reduces. How are you going to put 300 pounds of Alfred Hitchcock in the life? It would sink.
And at one point he had thought of floating by as a dead body, but he didn't want to get in the water, so he didn't want to do that either. And actually he was at the time trying to lose weight. He went from 300 to 200 pounds, and he publicized this in interviews he gave out and articles. He loved to, you know, to, to tell people about this. And then the idea, ah, oh, yes, reducto. It was an ad for it, and the audience sees the front of the newspaper, which is a before and after for this diet pill. Well, this diet pill or potion, whatever it was, people actually called the studio and wrote him letters asking him where could they get this, and it was all made up. I mean, to me, that's genius. When he finished the picture, he went over to London to make the two free French movies and left my mother over here. Well, the minute he left, Mr. Zanna came in and started wanting to cut it. He wanted to cut this and cut that, and, you know, and she wasn't going to let him. She called my father and said, all right, now what do I do? You know, if he wants to do this, that, and the other, he owns a studio. <laughs> Zanuck made minimal cutting. This didn't take away from the meat of the film. He wanted to have his stamp on that because he felt that, you know, Hitchcock would deliver something that would be, uh, you know, noted by the Academy members. He wanted to do the same thing that Selznick did. That's what he wanted to do. The initial reviews, really good, both from The Hollywood Reporter and Variety, they felt it was an achievement. You know, they had never seen anything like this before. They predicted huge grosses. Bosley Crowther, who just began reviewing, really loved it. And then, Crowther had a second opinion where he said that the portrait of the Nazi, it was very problematic. Well, of course, this got some other people, uh, their hackles were up and they began to attack. For example, Dorothy Thompson, who was working for the New York Trib, she said, I'm going to give this film uh, 10 days to get out of town. And another reviewer said, you know, if Germany saw this film, it's like a poster for, for, for Nazism. These are erudite people that could not see the point here. And of course, Tallulah, in a New York profile, just the same time, went to Hitchcock's defense and called them moronic to think that this was a, a, a pro-Nazi film. Zanuck was very proud of the movie. This was an A production, and then pressure was put on him to withdraw his support of the film in terms of advertising and getting the film to other theaters. And he didn't get behind the film, and it didn't have the wide release that it should. He let this masterwork die. Hitchcock knew of that, and that rankled Hitchcock. That's another reason why I didn't sign on for another film with Zanuck. He was rankled by that. I know my father was very disappointed that uh, the critical reaction wasn't better than it was because he felt, you know, he felt it was a good movie. This was a technical challenge in so many ways. The music, the one set, and here again he met that challenge. And it all works. It just holds you, the film. It never stops. This is a great movie as history has shown us. This is a masterwork of Hitchcock. When you are studying film, you learn Hitchcock, and filmmakers starting out, you know, he's an icon to them because of what he did and, and his individuality. As a family, we're so blessed because his name will continue to live on as long as people make films.